data, the summary and the results of the confirmed HF trial, you may well be a little bit, uh, a little bit surprised because you will hear in a second that this trial is about uh, iron deficiency, which we already started to discuss before uh, once we discussed acute heart failure. This is my conflict of interest. Let me start with uh, several statements. Let me start by saying that we have recognized that iron deficiency is a very, very frequent comorbidity, both in stable and in acute heart failure. Heart failure in around 50% of cases is complicated by iron deficiency. And as I said, although intuitively we are linking iron deficiency with anemia, neither the prevalence nor the consequences of iron deficiency are related to anemia. The statement number two I would like to make is that heart failure complicated by iron deficiency is very ominous clinical condition. It is always related with poor exercise capacity, quality of life, and more importantly with a high risk of mortality and morbidity which gives us a hint that perhaps correction of iron deficiency itself may well be an attractive therapeutical option. This has been tested in few bigger trials. One of them is called FAIR HF trial. And in this FAIR HF trial, we tested a hypothesis uh, that uh, by giving IV iron, we would end up with a positive, favorable effects in patients with, IV, with iron deficiency. You may well be interested how we defined iron deficiency in this group. We defined on the basis of low ferritin level, below 100, and uh, if normal, with based on low TSAT level. I will refer to this once I discuss confirm HF. In this trial, we observed, as you see here very clearly, that IV iron repletion in patients with iron deficiency would end up with improvement in patient global assessment, NEHA functional plus exercise capacity, and quality of life. However, we obviously would always like to have a broader clinical information. So this FAIR HF trial gave us a promising results, but we all felt that it needed to be replicated. We also wanted to investigate some other clinically relevant outcomes. And uh, last but not least, we wanted to see whether the long-term treatment would result in a favorable outcomes. This is why we, we designed and executed the CONFIRM HF trial, which importantly also investigated whether IV iron in patients in iron deficiency would have the effect on the outcomes. The CONFIRM HF trial data results were presented recently. I'm sorry, the slides order has something changed. So let me summarize the design of the CONFIRM HF. In this trial, we included patients with NEHA class two and three and impaired ejection fraction. And iron the, we made sure that all of them had uh, elevated BNP to ensure the diagnosis of heart failure. And more importantly, we have very simple definition of iron deficiency. Low ferritin level, and if normal, transfer in saturation between 20%. We can debate whether this is optimal definition, but definitely, as you see in a second, it works very well in both trials, in the FAIR HF and the CONFIRM HF. As you may know, blinding is an issue in patients receiving IV iron because IV iron is a brownish solution. So we made sure that both patients and the clinical staff were blinded. We used curtains, we used black syringes, we used unblinded and blinded personnel. We 
designed a trial in which we randomized our patients to ferric carboxymaltose or placebo. We treated our patients and observed them for one year. The primary endpoint, as you see here, was at the 24 weeks. So the primary endpoint of the trial was a change in the six minute walking test distance from baseline to week 24. We also evaluated several key secondary endpoints, like a six minute walking test at some other time points, patient global score, NEHA classes, quality of life, and importantly, we also focus on the outcome related secondary endpoint, which was the hospitalization and mortality. These events were prospectively collected and evaluated by the blinded endpoint committee. This is a patient disposition. Altogether, we screened around 100 patients, uh, 600 patients, half of whom were included into the trial. Patients were randomized one to one, and as you can clearly see, only three patients out of this uh, 204 were finally missing. So we had a very close and very, I would say, thorough follow-up of these patients. This is the baseline characteristic. You see age is around 70 years. Patients uh, represent class two and three, equally distributed, half-half. Importantly, as you see, these patients tended to have a rather lower, lowish blood uh, ejection fraction, but not very low the mean of around 20, uh, sorry, 36, 37 percent, uh, with a typical comorbidities affecting heart failure. Very importantly, these patients were optimally managed pharmacologically. Virtually everyone were receiving beta blocker therapy, AC inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and very importantly, around 60 percent were also receiving mineralocorticoid receptor inhibitors. As you can see, patients were mainly involved in the trial based on a low ferritin level below 100 nanograms per milliliter. This is the final result of the trial. At the 24-week follow-up, patients treated with ferric calboximaltose they tended to have a significant improvement in six minute walking test by about 80 meters, where are those treated with placebo, they deteriorated having the distance uh, decreased by around 11 meters, which altogether gave us the treatment effect favoring ferric calboximaltose of 33 meters. This magnitude of improvement where was only seen in the previous resynchronization trials. Secondary endpoints followed this favorable pathway. As you see here <coughs> in the self-reported patient global assessment score, the improvement was seen already very early and it sustained, very importantly, it sustained until the end of the one year follow-up. Similarly, patients receiving ferric carboximaltose, they tended to have an improvement in New York Heart Association class, which was observed already very early and sustained until the end of the study. These are changes in six-minute walking test and fatigue score, which simply reflects the magnitude of the symptoms the patients were developing during the six-minute walking test. As you see here, the trend favoring the active treatment is seen already very early and the effects sustained until the end of the follow-up. And the final slide regarding the improvement in secondary endpoints summarizes quality of life. If you see here both Kansas City questionnaire and EQ5D VASCO improved favoring the treatment patients, uh, in patients receiving ferric carboximaltose. Perhaps this slide is also very important from the physician perspective. 
This slide summarizes the outcomes data prospectively collected. As you he see here, I'm sorry, as you see here, there was no change in the death rate. However, in the population of only 300 patients, we altogether observed 26 deaths. However, if we analyzed hospitalizations due to worsening of heart failure, you see there was a hazard ratio of 0.39, which was highly statistically significant, favoring patients receiving ferric carboximaltose. And if we take into consideration the recurrent hospitalizations, the hazard ratio was 0.30, again, highly statistically significant. I remember very well then when I wrote the paper, Professor Svedberg was a guest editor of the European Heart Journal. And in the discussion I wrote, 70% reduction in the risk of hospitalization. Carl disagreed and asked me to correct this, saying it was statistically significant. However, this 70% is a little bit overestimate because the, because the range can be from 86% to 40%. I obviously accepted his criticism, but still the message is we have a very promising result for the future trials. This is the secondary endpoint summarized in the context of Kaplan-Meier curve, and as you see here, very clearly the curves tended to separate very early, and the effect is sustainable until the end of the study. What about the subgroup analysis? We did the subgroup analysis in all pre-specified subgroups. What is particularly important, we did it for patients with normal hemoglobin level and in patients with low hemoglobin level. And if you see here, there, is, uh, there are no differences here. Last but not least, you would be interested to see what ab about the adverse events. To make long story short, there was no safety concern. The treatment was well tolerated, was safe, and uh, both all adverse events and serious adverse event, there was no difference between patients receiving active treatment and placebo. It gave us a conclusion that uh, in symptomatic patients with chronic heart failure and iron deficiency, treatment with uh, ferric calboxy maltose, so IV iron, over one year period, uh, period resulted in sustainable improvement in functional capacity, symptoms, and quality of life. And for all us physicians, also gave us a hint that it may reduce the risk of hospitalizations due to heart failure worsening. To further, analyze already existing data, we just recently, together with uh, my colleague Eva Jankowska, did the meta-analysis of six trials listed here. And uh, we saw very clearly that there is a very uniform and very clear picture in all of these trials. With, as you see here, around 900 patients altogether, favoring treatment with IV iron over no treatment or placebo in terms of improvement in functional capacity, and perhaps this is what you want to see if you take four studies which also collected the information about hospitalization, you see here a uh, striking difference in favor of uh, patients receiving IV iron. Last but not least, I am going to show you our plans for the future. We definitely are going to extend and consolidate the evidence. We will be analyzing individual data for all the trials. We will be doing the trial in patients with preserved ejection fraction. And uh, there is an ongoing trial, EFFECT HF, with a slightly different endpoint when we are evaluating the effect of ferric carboxymal maltose on exercise tolerance. However, we are using peak oxygen consumption. Last but not least, we are planning mortality and morbidity trial to address the question whether this promising therapy would affect the outcome. Thank you for your attention.